Yeah, thank you, uh, Susan, and thank you for everybody joining us this morning. I want to kind of go through some uh, ideas uh, that are quite easy to use to take existing documentation and really kind of summarize it down to the essence and really kind of avoid the whole paragraph narrative style. <laughs> and so I've got three examples here. We're going to look at them in more detail as we go through. Uh, and you just imagine that if you had a project document, it could be a plan, a proposal, uh, an approach document. You know, there are many things you could have, like a requirement spec or even a backlog for Agile. Uh, those documents tend to be very, very wordy. And so my first example here is a wordy project summary. And if you uh, read that, and we're going to read it a little bit later on, uh, you find it is it is difficult to actually figure out what the summary is because uh, there's so much you know stuff that is uh, superfluous in there uh, that doesn't need to be there. Uh, for example, um, uh, the second, uh, uh, like the line three says, after analysis of several clients, the company has decided to go upgrade to 1.2 and create 1.3. And the team will be located in US and China. And so there's a lot of extra uh, fluff in the paragraph. And if you really kind of wanted a quick read of what it actually was, you'd have to kind of print it off or get a digital highlight pen and figure out what on earth is going on in the project. Now, if you take that paragraph and replicate it maybe 10, 15 times over 10, 15 pages, and that becomes a project plan, you can see that a lot of this kind of narrative style text uh, can really become overwhelming uh, in, a, in a document. Uh, another example is the constraint. So all systems have constraints, like uh, the data they should be accessing, or the versions of software they should run on, or the hardware platforms they are compatible with. Uh, this constraint here is, uh, again, I took it from a real example. Uh, it says constraints are a natural part of any project. Uh, that's superfluous. We don't need to know that. Constraints have been well documented over history. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, can be viewed by Googling the product constraints again. And so only till you get to the end of the paragraph do you actually see the actual constraints. So if you can imagine a, kind of a couple of pages of this stuff, uh, it is very difficult to kind of parse out and really not kind of miss uh, some key points of the system. And then the whole idea about requirements. Again, you could be using a requirements spec or requirements document. You could be doing Agile with a backlog. Uh, all those uh, media uh, kind of um, uh, allow you to kind of be, narrow, be, be wordy and narrative uh, in the definition. Uh, this one here, we're going to take and actually break down in a couple of different ways later on. But you can see that the ambiguity here, the system should allow uh, entry of data items relevant for customer payment or allow a user ID to be entered to charge the amount to if an ID is used and there are sufficient customer account funds, then either request a credit increase or note notify that the account is overdrawn and flag the account as overdrawn, OD, email a receipt. So the trouble with this is it's ambiguous and there's uh, several if if thens in there <laughs> and several ands and ors. So if you have a paragraph with ands and ors in it, it becomes confusing later on which way they combine. You know, should it be this and this or this, or should it be uh, these two together and then separately, you know, con consider the other option. So uh, from a project summary constraint and requirement standpoint, the whole narrative text approach uh, it looks impressive because it kind of occupies volume, uh, but it is very difficult to kind of pass uh, downstream by the team members. So um, the trouble with this uh, this approach is that it becomes ignored, uh, or if people actually read it, they are going to make mistakes. So a uh, very, very early source of mistakes in a project or things that are going to go missing because nobody really understood uh, what they really had. So uh, now we can't really just get away with document get get away with no documentation. If you had no documentation, it would be very difficult to find errors quickly because uh, you'd be looking at the code or the system solution at the end, and then going to find the mistakes. It's way too late at that point. Uh, people are uh, uh, people age uh, uh, on a regular basis, and they kind of uh, don't f remember everything. Uh, so kind of writing things down is a way to remember key points either in individually or among a team or a population. Uh, a way to communicate to others. If we didn't have anything written down, we'll be verbally rehashing everything all the time. And that would be error prone and really kind of tedious. They're going to do that. 
if you had to kind of uh, verbalize a test plan to somebody every week because uh, they forgot what you had said, obviously not particularly efficient. And visibility for you and others, uh, visibility to see how things connect together, what the progress is, kind of where you are, and for others to kind of see that quickly uh, on your behalf too, so they can understand where you are and what you're kind of doing. So we've got to have some documentation uh, to kind of uh, just be efficient, uh, but having ones like the, the previous slide is obviously not a particularly good idea, but it is very, actually very common uh, how people do that. So we have a couple of examples to break these up. I'm going to use these example formats and uh, for the different examples I showed. Uh, firstly, tables. So I'm going to make a, a suggestion that there should be no more paragraphs anymore. The okay. zero anywhere. Now, if you like paragraphs, I suggest you become an author or writer of books because uh, they really have a lot of paragraphs in them. And that's kind of what people like to see. Uh, fiction and non-fiction, but if you are in the technical domain, IT, software, hardware, uh, that kind of stuff, I s really see no point anymore or no need to do paragraphs. Uh, again, they look impressive and they occupy lots of pages and they uh, can be kind of very uh, kind of uh, 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 grammatically wonderful to read. Uh, but in terms of conveying information, uh, the information kind of gets lost in the paragraph. So the first thing is to do tables. Uh, second one is to then uh, occupy that with a single sentence. So if you see a paragraph anywhere with uh, more than one sentence in there, more than one period, uh, then they get broken out into single items in a table format. Uh, that really kind of helps you figure out if the ands and the ors or the uh, kind of run on sentences are really part of the requirement or the, uh, the product scope or not. Uh, next one is to then label them. Uh, now we have things broken out and better organized and we can see it uh, then label it to make it a quick reference to know either to cross reference things or to organize or to uh, say we actually did something. And then uh, decision tables, uh, I'll go through some of these for requirements. Uh, that previous requirement I showed you about the payment issue is very ambiguous. It, it is ambiguous as it stands. It would be a little less ambiguous as a table and a lot less ambiguous as a decision table. And so we're going to take that particular example and then build a little decision table there. And then the last one would be a decision diagram or decision tree. Sometimes these uh, tables or the decision tables, uh, you can tell a lot from them. But sometimes going to see them visually also kind of helps. Now, you don't have to do a decision diagram every time. Uh, that can be a lot of extra labor to going to draw it. But sometimes it's not obvious exactly the flow of events in a requirement and how the system should should uh, work. So uh, that would be another uh, one we're going to look at at the end of the presentation. So let's take the first example, uh, the project scope. Again, to look at the project scope paragraph there, even just one paragraph is overwhelming, I find. So we're going to look at tables, single sentences and labels of this one. Uh, what I've done here is going to parse out the paragraph and replace it by a table. And actually, there were eight things going on in that table uh, we listed. Now, the, the fun thing is that, um, A, you don't have to write a paragraph uh, and then convert it to a table. You're just going to write the table first and avoid the paragraph. If you do have paragraphs that need to be converted to kind of better understand what they are saying, then the conversion to the uh, table format is useful to just to see that uh, what's missing. Maybe things are said twice or three times in a different kind of way. Uh, so breaking out into the table with a single sentence uh, can help you kind of navigate and figure out errors in the paragraph itself. Again, we wouldn't keep both uh, paragraph and table. We're just going to replace the paragraph uh, with a table. Uh, this is the constraint. Again, that was a very fluffy constraint uh, written down there with only a few actual hard pieces of data at the end, uh, which we then parsed out into, into five constraints. Again, you can imagine the constraint paragraphs being a lot longer than the one I gave, uh, which is itself kind of a little overwhelming or ambiguous or difficult to kind of parse. So it's basically replacing the constraint uh, section with a, with a table uh, makes the things a lot easier. And now the requirements are another uh, another kind of ballpark issue. Uh, again, you can have the project plan documents in table format, 
But when it comes to requirements, they're typically more complicated and there's more chance of error and more impact sometimes if you have errors in them. So this particular one we read out before uh, is particularly ambiguous and it's just one of many uh, in a backlog of requirements. Let's take a, a way to kind of uh, make that better. <laughs> so we basically replace that paragraph uh, break out the items into separate sentences or separate concepts <laughs> and we label them on the far left column and now we can see you now what it's actually saying and actually look at the, the uniquely the if thens which are the three middle ones three four and uh, three four and five uh, that could they could be true uh, they are correctly stated uh, they could be false and we basically can then correct it and then things like the last sentence, like email uh, receipt of the transaction, again, that may be tied to a previous condition or it may be kind of separate, kind of uniquely done every time. And so by breaking out the requirements into pieces like this, we can then better detect what is correct and what is not correct in that requirement. Now, one of so the upside of the table is being more clear about what we've even set up to now. Uh, what it doesn't address yet are the other combinations we may have not have thought of. Now, there may be more than it, three ifs then, uh, if option B, if credit increase, and if account overdrawn. And there could be other combinations of those things or other options we are simply missing out of our requirements. So now we can, uh, we can see kind of what we have. Uh, we can now figure out kind of what we kind of don't have. Now, the way to do that is they're going to use a decision table. Now, you wouldn't use a decision table every time you do this uh, because decision tables can get a little complicated or uh, require some kind of a care to kind of put in place. Uh, but let's go through this one briefly. Um, so the table is our next uh, next version of doing the requirement. And we probably can detect quite a few mistakes in that just by breaking it up into a table. But really the question is, now the question is, is that does the table really kind of cover all of the options we care about? Because there could be some options we're missing uh, that are really devastating to the end user at the end. I remember working with a couple of healthcare teams a while back and their system was dispensing medications to the patient. And so if there were conditions occurring in the system and the, the way the healthcare provider typed in the numbers into the system, like an IV system, uh, then the, the patient would receive so many uh, milliliters or whatever it is of, uh, of medication in the IV bag. But when I saw the requirement, and their requirement looks more like the one back here in the crossed out paragraph here, my, my first reaction was, what does it even mean? And my next reaction was, does it really contain everything you care about? You are giving the patient medication at this point. Uh, so have you really kind of thought about all the issues? And so in that example, we took the, the, uh, the, the uh, table of the text and then uh, determine these conditions and outcomes. Now, this takes a little bit of practice to going to work on. And I'm going to give you a reference to a book uh, that does this particularly well uh, later on. Uh, but you can see uh, we basically take our text table at the top there and we figure out there are basically four conditions to going to worry about. Credit card is provided or an account with funds is provided or maybe an account without funds. And then con the last condition, uh, the user accepts a credit increase. So we've basically figured out four conditions um, and there are outcomes that take place as a result of the software running. Uh, payment accepted account flag is uh, flagged as a credit OD or overdrawn and then email receipt. And then we can figure out from the, the, the far right hand four columns uh, what true and false options there are and what the outcomes are likely to be or should be uh, given those options. So the thing I like about this table or the decision table is that it can cover a lot more combinations than we can really kind of write down in English text in the first table there. And so we have basically a, a, a truth or a true flag moving from left to right. So we have column number one, uh, true credit card, and then the other ones are not selected yet, uh, like ID funds, ID without funds, whatever. And then we go to payment accepted and email receipt. And then we move the truth to the second column and then say, well, we're not going to do a credit card. We're going to give you an account with money in it. And then we say, well, if that's true, what happens? We get the same outcome. The third column is uh, the ID fund, uh, sorry, ID account without funds. So we give them a zero 
or a negative uh, count with a, uh, with a, without the, inc with the incorrect balance. Uh, if that happens, then we then go to the accept credit card increase or accept credit increase. So if we have two trues there, we have the positive outcome. And then the fourth uh, requirement, we move the truth to the right now. And we now have a truth and a false combination for accept credit card increase or sorry, credit increase. And then we can say, well, if we have two trues in column three, then what happens if we have a true and a false in column four, uh, then the outcome is to do the accept the payment, but then basically flag the account as overdrawn. Now, this is a fairly straightforward money example, but you can imagine a braking system on a vehicle or healthcare medication or depositing funds into a, an, a bank account internationally overnight where you have kind of time zone problems and uh, processing time. Uh, there's there's a, a numerous examples where you really can't afford to have the combinations incorrect and that you really have to think through them. So with a little bit of practice, I think that the table above gives you a first view of what could be missing. But if that's not obvious, uh, and it's typically not obvious, then the table below uh, gives you a much better way to kind of look at the combinations and to figure out uh, what the outcomes are likely to be. And then you can obviously check back with the customer or the business analyst or the system engineer, whoever, and make sure they're kind of correct. So again, I think it's a really good way to take a very ambiguous uh, paragraph requirement and make it a lot more precise. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, you might decide that the table back here, uh, the decision table, is really good at laying out op options, but it becomes a little harder sometimes to navigate the flow of events and how the system should be constructed. Uh, and so the diagram, uh, the next one here, is the same thing, but in a kind of a flow format. So you wouldn't do this every time. It would be a little tedious to kind of do this every time uh, to kind of draw a picture. But when the, the workflow of the user is complicated or which piece of software should be called for the next you know, uh, response, or even should we write two pieces of software or one piece of software to kind of be reused, I think the uh, decision diagram is actually a particularly useful way to kind of clarify that. And it's just a kind of way to visually see again uh, the table kind of format. So typically, you're going to do, spend your time on the table uh, first and avoid the paragraph format. And then if that looks kind of complicated and you're not sure what it means, then do the decision table format. And then if that looks complicated and you're not sure exactly how the software is going to run uh, to implement that, uh, then you would then mitigate the risk of that by uh, the decision diagram. Now, uh, let's discuss other places you can do this uh, stuff. Um, so uh, my, my claim at the beginning was uh, you, you don't need to, uh, or teams don't need to write paragraphs again. And I've been able to control quite a few companies over the years, uh, in my case, 30 years, um, to avoid paragraph scheme. And when they get to that point, they really enjoy it. They actually like doing this kind of documentation because they're really clarifying the, the gist of the message very quickly and not getting sucked into or feel like they have to gonna be like a Shakespeare and write a bunch of pages that are gonna look impressive. So uh, this example here on the left is a project plan. Uh, all teams are gonna be worthy of a project plan of some kind. It could be in a Word document, it could be in a Confluence page or a Wiki page, uh, but kind of something that kind of clarifies what we're doing. And so what I have clients do now is basically remove all paragraphs everywhere. Okay? And they basically have a template in whatever media they want to use, like Confluence or Word, and the template just calls out what information they're going to put in. So now scope is a table with single sentences. Maybe they want to clarify outer scope. Uh, things that will not be done for the particular release, uh, clarify customers that they want to, to deal with or customer types, and all of the other items below, like make by reuse decisions, assumptions, constraints, lifecycle steps, uh, how data will be managed, like project data, stakeholders, uh, required resources, uh, training plan for uh, the team members, and measurement, all those become their own little table. And so now our project plan is like a wiki or a confluence page or a Word document or even Excel. Uh, but there are, are basically these predefined tables that are the, with the headings there 
uh, that allow the team to kind of type in stuff. So whereas before they may have felt they have to spend a week writing a pretty narrative document that would be fun to read, but would it be ignored? Now they can maybe spend a couple of hours clarifying the essence of what they really care about uh, for both them and the reader uh, by using the table format. And then the top right, uh, we have other areas we can apply this to. Uh, whether we're doing a agile team in a backlog or a, a hybrid lifecycle that's more of a spec oriented, um, uh, proposal oriented kind of project, uh, we can have uh, tables uh, for user classes, uh, context diagrams, a picture, uh, like a bit like the, the diagram I showed, epics. Uh, there can be a list of epics in a table. Uh, user stories can be in a table format or in a kind of a Jira confluence kind of a, a list format. The use cases can be in their own table. So if you know what a use case is, where it has particular uh, parameters of a use case, like uh, the preconditions, postconditions, acceptance criteria, et cetera, exception conditions, all those pieces of a use case are then typed uh, in a table format. Again, easy to fill out. And there can be lists in a table of non-functional requirements and quality attributes. And if you are using a tool like Confluence or Jira, uh, these can be uh, uh, issue types in Jira. Again, you're building up a backlog of issues or backlog of uh, user stories or backlog of requirements. You could have an issue type of quality attribute or an issue type of non-functional requirement. Again, that builds up your list. If you're not using Jira or some kind of a tool like that, then uh, these lend themselves well to a table format uh, with those items being the headers of the table, a bit like the one on the left-hand side. Similarly with the design, I've worked with companies that have very voluminous or very uh, kind of a narrative design documents uh, that kind of have paragraphs and paragraphs of information. Uh, again, we stripped all that out and put them in terms of a, a table format. Uh, so the architecture diagram was a picture, obviously. Interfaces was a table. So basically, just a, a table in the document of interfaces to uh, connect to. Uh, data format, similar, and algorithms. Again, to avoid the whole narrative paragraph kind of style. And then similarly uh, with test plans. And people, people typically do much better on test plans anyway, because uh, they have a more of a unique test case they're going to run and a result to look out for. But even so, sometimes they put a lot of narrative text in the documents and uh, we can break that out too. So it is possible and actually quite straightforward uh, to take any document you have and just basically resurrect it and uh, kind of this kind of the table structured single sentence kind of format uh, with diagrams. And typically they go down, like a, a good example where they go down by uh, maybe 50% or 80% in, in uh, uh, content. Uh, just because we're removing a lot of the fluff and the repeat and the uh, narrative kind of text. Okay. So you really can make these kind of actually very short and concise and a lot more readable and usable uh, by your audience downstream. Now, uh, before I go to q and I have a few minutes left for Q&A. Um, so if you would like some free assistance, okay, uh, all you have to do is fill out my survey. Uh, there is an IT survey, which is the first link. It takes about 10 minutes to fill out, maybe less than 10 minutes. And what I have done with people in exchange for the survey about how their team is performing and where their typical uh, challenges are, to so just kind of know what the industry is doing, uh, then I, I will res respond with your survey responses with a kind of a free help, uh, references and whatever. So if you would like some extra uh, information to kind of fix your challenges, can just tell me what they are. That's all, all we're doing is trading a survey for uh, free help. I do uh, have a U I have a YouTube channel. I do put a lot of these type of things into YouTube. I think I have uh, 20 roughly videos up there right now. This presentation is being YouTubeized. I'm in the middle of the edit round, so uh, there will be a, a YouTube video on this particular one too. So have a, take a look at that. There's quite a few um, uh, videos up there on both Agile and non-Agile. Uh, topic areas. And then I have been writing articles uh, for a good 25, 30 years now. And so there's the short article link on the left. And when it comes to requirements, particularly the uh, the decision table and the decision diagram, uh, a good book to refine that in is the book by Cole on software requirements, which is a, obviously an Amazon 
uh, or Kindle kind of book. Uh, it covers many other issues too, but uh, the terms of those, the, the type of diagrams I mentioned before, particularly the, uh, the decision, decision table and the decision diagram, uh, there's a good chapter on those in that document. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, let's see, for Neil, how do you see this approach fitting with MBSE? I don't have a good I don't have a good background or any background on model based system engineering, but but if you if you okay. see a model based system engineering document, and it has voluminous paragraphs, then you uh, you can make them tables for sure. Thank you so much, Neil, for presenting with us. And you, thank you very much. Bye bye.